Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. The resurrection is absolutely pivotal to our faith and absolutely changes our living even right now. We want to pray. We want to consider some of the amazing resurrection thoughts uh, as we look into the precious Word of God today. So God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, we are eternally indebted to you because Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead. He is alive forevermore. And because of his resurrection, we too also will live in resurrection bodies one day in your glory if we put our faith and trust in Jesus. So, Father, as we contemplate and think through some of the wonderful truths and stories in the scriptures concerning the resurrection, Father, grant us great grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This really is a great time to think through, what do I really believe about life? What do I really believe about life? I mean, sometimes different parts of the year can be so busy. You know, we move for, into the summertime and we're usually caught up with activities and um, just enjoying the good weather, hopefully outside and all of that kind of thing. And then we move into the fall time and establishing, again, new schedules for school and work and that kind of thing. And then, of course, the, the rush during Christmas time. And then after Christmas time, there's usually kind of that letdown and trying to sort of just hang in there as we get through the winter months. And then finally spring comes and everything is new and fresh. And we anticipate some of the activities for the summertime. And that springtime seems to be a good time to really think through, well, what do I really believe in? What do I... What, what, what is my philosophy of life? How do I approach life? What do I, what do I really believe about life? Now, some have kind of adopted sort of a fatalistic viewpoint about life. It's just, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, it, it'll ha you know, I can't, I'm, I'm really can't control events. I mean, some have sort of adopted a philosophy, you're in control of your destiny. But I think the, the older we get and the more that we experience life, things just happen that, we're, that is so out of our hands, so out of control. Isn't that right? Uh, and, and, and I think we've come to, some of us have come to sort of a position where we're just fatalistic. You know, it's, you know, destiny will happen. Things will just happen. Whatever happens, happens. Some have adopted a belief system that says, Let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. We, we see that some, even in Scripture, had adopted that kind of viewpoint. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And actually, if you want to get ahead of me a little bit, well, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is the, the chapter on the resurrection. And, and some have adopted a kind of a, that kind of mentality. Um, it's described as YOLO. You only live once. So you grab the gusto and you, you, you seize the opportunities because you only live one. You, once. You seek those opportunities. You seek those thrills. You seek that gusto because you only live once. You know, even religious people uh, grab onto that kind of th thinking and that kind of philosophy. In Jesus' day, there was a, actually a whole group of religious folks called the Sadducees that em embraced that YOLO mentality. They're called Sadducees because, you see, they're sad, you see. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Actually, the Sadducees, uh, and that's just how I remember them, the, the Sadducees, sad, you see, you get it. But anyways, uh, actually, the Sadducees were not sad. They were actually quite a happy people, uh, very rich, actually. They felt that riches were part of the blessing of God, and they wanted to seize all the riches because it seemed to make life easier and more fun and more enjoyable. And so there was a very rich slice of the, the community and they adopted, um, they became part of the, the party of the Sadducees and they, they believed in riches and they didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in angels and demons. Oh, they believed in God. God looked, uh, looked after them, blessed them, even though some of them through their nastiness got their riches, but they felt that if they actually got the riches, that was the blessing of God because that was their... That was their philosophy. That was their approach to life. You only live once. You got to seize it and grab the gusto and grab the riches because that makes life more enjoyable. 
That's why they were so keen in challenging Jesus, who clearly talked about eternal life. That we, when we die, we will have to give an answer to God. And then in resurrected bodies, good or bad, we will, uh, our, our destiny will be determined. And we will either, either live with God in His glory in resurrection bodies, or we will be damned forever in the burning lake of fire because of our, re, our reject, rejection of God and His plan and the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Sadducees didn't believe in all that. They didn't believe there was an afterlife. You, know, you just, yes, God will look after us now, but forget about demons, angels, uh, afterlife, and all that kind of thing. No, you just only live once. That's why they challenged Jesus, and they came up with that ridiculous story. We looked at it very briefly last week, right? I mean, there's this fellow that has a wife, and he dies, and his brother's supposed to marry her and have children on his behalf, according to the Old Testament law. And, um, and he dies, and they didn't have any children, and the third brother marries her, the fourth brother, fifth, sixth, seven, seven brothers all together marry this woman, they all die. And so the Sadducees, who did not believe in an afterlife, almost laughingly said to Jesus, so in the resurrection that you're talking about, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Because they told that story to make it look absolutely ridiculous that this afterlife is absolutely ridiculous. And you remember that Jesus cut through all of that. And he said, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. We will rise again not to be engaged in marriage and that kind of thing. It's a whole new dimension. We'll be like, like angels, really. Um, and by the way, in terms of the resurrection, you, you say you believe in the first four, five books of the Bible, the books of Moses... How does God, in the book of Moses, in the beginning of the Bible, address himself? I am, not I was, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not a God of the dead. He's the God of the living. In other words, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though physically they died, their spirits are alive with God, waiting for that resurrection day to enjoy his glory forever. Jesus made it very clear. There is a resurrection. Yeah, praise God. Um, you see, there's even some Christians that believe that, that don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in an afterlife. You only live once. The Corinthians were some of the Corinthians, and that's why I'm just I'm just so grateful that some of their struggles philosophically and theologically are recorded for us in Scripture because they struggle with it. Is there really an afterlife? Well, uh, shouldn't we just eat, drink, and be merry? And let's just, you know, just grab the gusto. Does it really matter how we live our lives? Just have fun. Just have fun. And some of them were embracing that theology, that thinking, that philosophy. And Paul writes this amazing chapter for the, for the, for the Corinthians to help them to understand there is a resurrection. There is a, re there is a, a, a resurrection. Well, he, he makes it very clear. The resurrection actually is actually pivotal, pivotal to our faith and actually pivotal to our living. He would say it this way, if there is no afterlife, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus did not rise. And if, paraphrasing, if Jesus did not rise, you are in trouble with God. Now, you can just read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Some of them said there is no resurrection. And Paul makes the, the statement, well, then if there is no resurrection... If, if you only live once and it's all done, then actually, when you think about it, Jesus did not rise from the dead. Because if the dead are not raised, Jesus did not rise. And then he just, he challenges the Corinthians. Now, think about that just for a moment. Because if there is no resurrection and Jesus did not die and rise again from the dead, you are in trouble with God. Listen to how he puts it. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now let me pick it up at verse 12, and then we'll move down to verse 19. Actually, the first part of verse 20. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and beginning at verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been, has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, listen to this, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. 
More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that, the, that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins, then those who, who also have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died believing in Jesus, they are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now think about this for a moment. If there is no resurrection, Jesus did not rise from the dead. Now what does that mean for us, that we people who say that we follow Jesus? Well, listen to this. We, let me just paraphrase it for you just a little bit here. That means we have really nothing to share. We have no good news to share. <laughs> we don't really have something to believe in that will carry us through, <laughs> as it were, forever. We really, it doesn't really matter what you believe in then. If, if there's only this life. Now, we're making up stories about God because God said He raised Jesus from the dead, but if the dead are not raised, Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, so we're just making up stories here. We're not telling the truth about what God has done. Our faith really has no impact. Some people have the idea that, well, as long as you're sincere in your faith, well, does it really matter? If there is no resurrection, then it doesn't really matter what you believe Believe in. Therefore, your faith has no impact at all in your life. If, there, if no, there's no resurrection, then we can't escape the consequences of sin. God is going to continually be angry with us. There is no forgiveness. There is no gracious hand of God. You just hope you escape the, 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 the lightning bolts of God's judgment on you. There is no forgiveness. And if we die, well, that's just the end. That's the end. And joy, you just sort of see if you can eke out some kind of happiness somewhere along the line. But there's no joy when things go wrong, when things go bad, and certainly not when we die. But Paul makes a beautiful statement here, he says. He says this, I love this, verse 20, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, praise God. And folks, it's not that the afterlife proves that there is a resurrection. No, what the resurrection of Jesus Christ does is prove that there is an afterlife. And, and so, so we need to examine, well, did Jesus really rise again from the dead? Well, it's pretty clear Jesus rose again from the dead. Now, down through the ages, down through the last 2,000 years, there have been multiple theories of trying to debunk the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. Oh, Jesus didn't really die. He just, he just kind of swooned, just kind of fainted, and he kind of revived himself. And, and, and doctors and lawyers and professionals have looked at some of those those excuses and some of those, those plausible theories and have debunked them all. The final conclusion is that Christ truly indeed, indeed rise again from the dead. And there's piles of eyewitnesses. If you were ta to take the historical situation of Jesus rising again from the dead to a court of law, there is not a single court that could actually say it did not happen. You bring in eyewitness after eyewitness after eyewitness. And I, and I just love going through the story of the eyewitnesses that saw Jesus alive. So let me begin. Let me begin. Jesus dies on Friday. He's crucified on the cross. And he said he did it for you and for me. He claimed that he could have escaped from the cross. But no, he went all the way so that he could declare on the cross, it is paid for. Your sins are paid for. It is finished. Hallelujah. And Jesus died. Died before he was supposed to because even the Roman governor said he's dead already. Um, yeah, they, they did. They, they proved that he died. They speared him to make sure that he was indeed dead. Um, they bury him in a, in, a, in, a, in a tomb, rolled a huge heavy rock, rolled it into its place so it was, it was completely um, entombed. He was completely entombed. And, and then they even put a seal around it and posted a Roman guard to make sure that no one could steal the body. Because if someone stole the body, then they could come up with a, you know, a fairy tale that Jesus you know, somehow rose again from the dead. No, no, they sealed it. They, they, they had a Roman guard around there. 
And, and so everything was finally settled. Friday night, Saturday, everything's quiet. And then Sunday morning, everything broke loose. The Bible tells us an angel of the Lord came down and rolled the rock that covered the tomb away, rolled it away, rolled it up an incline. That heavy, probably multi-ton rock rolled <laughs> up the grade uh, because it would slide down into or roll down into the groove so that the door would be secure and sealed. It was rolled up and the angel sits on it. And of course, the Roman guards are just like they are just... I mean, they just collapse out of absolute fear. I mean, nothing like this, that there's no training on the planet that could prepare them for this. And they just collapse. And we're not told when Jesus actually rose again from the dead. Um, you see, because the opening of the grave was not to <laughs> let Jesus out. It was to let us in to see that he was not dead. He's not dead. Well, the, the, the soldiers eventually would come to life again, <laughs> as it were, and they went into town, and they didn't go back to their commanding officers. They went back to the religious leaders. You know, this one that you said that we were supposed to guard to make sure he didn't escape? Well, there was an earthquake, and there was angels, and like, like uh, and an angel, and like we're, uh, we don't know how to, we do not know how to explain it, but the body's not there. And so they actually, the religious leaders paid the, the soldiers off to say, well, we fell asleep and the disciples came and stole the body away. <laughs> like, it's just like, I don't think so. But that's the story. That was the story that they tried to come up with at the time. But meanwhile, early Sunday morning, some of the women came down to finish the embalming process of the body of Jesus because on Friday night, uh, they weren't able to complete it all because Jesus died late Friday afternoon. Uh, Sabbath starts, the day of worship starts actually on sunset of the Friday night. And so they didn't have a time to finish the embalming process for the body of Jesus. So they came early Sunday morning to finish it because they couldn't do it on the, on the Sabbath, of course. And so uh, Sabbath ended at sunset. So they needed to wait for daylight on Sunday to actually com complete the process. They come down. The women, of course, are, there's Mary, there's um, Mary, there's uh, Mary, the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, Susanna, and others that we have some record of being part of this early morning group of ladies who want to um, uh, meet together and complete this embalming process. And so they, they get down there, and of course they forgot that, you know, the, the, the rock is rolled into place. Who's going to roll the stone away from us? The soldiers certainly aren't going to do that. Who's going to do that? We need permission to do that. But they get down to the grave. The stone is rolled away. Where's the body of Jesus? They see two angels. Um, and the angels tell the women. I mean, it, it scares the living daylights out of the women, of course. Uh, but the angels say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not. You're looking for Jesus. He is not here. He's risen from the dead. Now go tell his disciples. Jesus is alive. The women sk skedaddle back. This would be like 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning. And they skedaddle back to pl the place where the disciples are, 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 are resting and, and, and sleeping in fear of the religious leaders coming. Well, they crucified Jesus, our leader. They're going to crucify us too. So they're all trembling in fear. But the women come in big panic. And they tell the disciples, we didn't see the body of Jesus. Peter and John, two of the disciples, race down to the tomb. Of course, it's skinny John that beats big, thick uh, uh, Peter down there. And, uh, and, but both of them, check it out. There, there's no body. There's no body. There's no body. And then the women gravitate back to the, 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 the garden, the, the tomb site. And Mary particularly is crying and crying. And I'm sure all the women are crying, particularly, but particularly Mary. And she bends over to, to, to look once again. And, the, and there, there's an angel there. And he says, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And she just tears are streaming down. She turns away from the entrance of the tomb and there's the gardener there. And the gardener says, woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Oh, if you know where they've taken my Jesus, if you know where they've taken my Lord, tell me and I'll go get his body. I'll go to get it. And, and then the gardener says, Mary. Well, it wasn't the gardener at all. It was Jesus. And she finally looks up and realizes it's Jesus. And she rushes with the other women and they hang on to Jesus. They don't want to let him go. Go tell my disciples. Go tell my disciples. 
I'll meet them all. I'll meet them all. Sure enough, Jesus, we don't know the details of this. Afterwards, Jesus appears to Peter, Peter, uh, 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 on a separate event. Uh, later on, not too long after he appears to Peter, he appears to two men on the road. Two men, Cleopas and his companion, are, it looks like they're fleeing Jerusalem and they're leaving and they're going to a little town called Emmaus. And so on the road to Emmaus, they're talking about all the stuff that's happened over the last few days. And the stranger walks up with them. And now, what are you talking about? Oh, what do you mean, what are we talking about? You don't know what's going on here? What things? Well, there was this man, Jesus, did miracles. And we thought he was the Messiah. And, and, and he died. And we thought that was the end of the story. But some women went to the grave and they, 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 they said that his body wasn't there. Uh, and this is the third day. Um, and Jesus, it was Jesus, the stranger on the road to Emmaus, says, are you that foolish? Are you that slow to understand? The Messiah had to die and rise again from the dead. And he shows them the scriptures. They don't recognize Jesus. They just think he's some stranger giving them a Bible study as they're walking along to the town. They sit down for, for uh, dinner. They sit down for dinner and the, the stranger gives the blessing, and as he gives the blessing, their eyes are finally open. They recognize that it's Jesus, and, and then Jesus disappears. Wow. Wow. And then these two guys, of course, they're not going to keep on running away from Jerusalem. They're running back now. They're running back to Jerusalem. we got to tell the disciples, and they get back there. And, of course, the, everything's a buzz because... The women have come back. They said they saw Jesus. Peter's come back and said, I've seen Jesus. Cleopas and his friend um, tell their story about Jesus meet, meeting them, uh, meeting Jesus on the road and, and having lunch with him. And, and they're, they're just like, it's just one big buzz among the disciples. And then all of a sudden that evening, who appears but Jesus himself? And they're blown away. I can imagine them all stepping back like, Woo! It's a ghost. No, no, give me something to eat. I'll show you I'm not a ghost. And he eats some fish and it doesn't plop on the ground <laughs> because it's a real body transformed. Jesus can appear and disappear. He can go through walls, go through closed doors. Amazing. But it's him. that they. I'm sure they're checking him out. Perhaps he's even touching them and blessing them because he does say, peace be with you. One of the disciples wasn't there. His name is Thomas. We call him the Doubting Thomas. When the disciples, after Jesus left, the disciples, when they see Thomas, Thomas, we saw Jesus. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't believe unless I actually touch him, touch him. The following Sunday, Jesus appears to his disciples again and sees Thomas. Thomas, come, feel it. Feel where the nails went into my, my wrists, my hands. See where the spear went into my side. See my feet with the nail, where the nails went through my feet. Oh, my Lord, oh, my God, blessed are you because you see and you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Wow, wow. They, 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 they believed. And, of course, then there, um, uh, there's other stories, of course, of Jesus appearing. Jesus had said that he was going to meet all the disciples up in, in Galilee, the northern part of Israel, on a mountain by the Lake of Galilee. And uh, so they, they make their way up there and... Some of, seven of them decide to go fishing. Peter leading the charge there. And you know a little bit of that story. God willing, we'll perhaps take a look at that uh, next week. But Jesus appears to his disciples again, again. And then shortly after that, there's the big meeting on the mountain. And 500 people see Jesus. And I, and I love the honesty of scriptures. Some doubted. No, 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 that can't be Jesus. But by the end of the meeting, they became an eyewitness. It has to be Jesus. He's alive. He's physical, flesh and bone. He's alive. I, I, I couldn't believe that he was, good, he was alive. We got here. I, I wasn't sure he was alive. But he's alive. He's alive. And I, I'll give my life for it. And many of them did, actually. But Jesus is alive. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 in the first few verses tells us that actually then Jesus afterwards appeared to his own family. It says to James, 
We're assuming that the family was there. You see, the, even his own family, his physical family, Mary and Joseph did have other children. Um, it was James and Joseph Jr. and, and uh, Simon and Judas, Jude, we know him as Jude, um, and several sisters, probably th- at least three sisters. Um, big family, big family, eight, may- maybe eight or more children altogether. Of course, Jesus was not the son of Joseph, but rather of God the Father. He was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit, so that he was called the Son of God. But his physical family, the family he grew up with, even they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. But it wasn't until that he appeared resurrected that finally now they put their faith and trust in Jesus. And then Jesus would meet several times, many times, with the disciples before he ascended on high. And then lastly, he would appear actually to the Apostle Paul in an amazing event when he was actually out to, cruci- or to persecute uh, believers up in uh, north of Israel in Damascus and so on. And some of us know a little bit of that story. Wow. Uh, you take all these eyewitnesses, all these events together, and there's no, no, no way that Jesus did not rise from the dead. In other words... Jesus clearly, clearly rose again from the dead. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Now, why do we have all these, these, these resurrection stories? Why do we have all these eyewitnesses? Well, it's to show that Jesus rose again from the dead. And again, let me say this. It's not the afterlife that proves the resurrection of Jesus. No, no, no. Folks, understanding historically, there's no doubt historically whether it's believers or non-believers, if they look at the historical records clearly, Jesus rose again from the dead. He died and He rose again from the dead. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that proves the afterlife. There is a life afterwards. It's not about a fatalistic life. Oh, what happens, happens. And it's not YOLO, you only live once. No, no, no. There is a, an eternal life. There is an eternal life to be had. And if I put my faith and trust in Jesus, He gives me eternal life. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means simply this. Especially for us as believers. Let me take you to the last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says this in verse 58. Last verse. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Persecutions will come. Trials will will come. Heartache will come. War may come. You see that in Eastern Europe. Whoa. All those things may happen. Sickness may happen. But don't let that move you. Stand firm. Stand firm. (laughs) Why? Because Christ is risen. He's risen and dead. Indeed. There is a resurrection. There is an afterlife. Because then he says this, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Wow. Your kapos is not kenos in the curios. <laughs> your labor in the Lord is not lost. He uses kind of an alliteration there. Yeah, in, in English, your labor in the Lord is not lost, but in the Greek, it's even more powerful because it uses the Look, powerful sound. Your kapos is not kainos in the curio. Your, your work, your labor in the Lord Jesus is not lost. What you do for Jesus is recorded and you'll be eternally rewarded. So our philosophy in life is I give glory to God in the name of Jesus because I will enjoy the glory of God in the name of Jesus for all eternity in the presence of God in His glory. And what a joy, what a pleasure that will be. woo ha! All because Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? The resurrection of Jesus. Let's think about that. That time of year, let's think about that. What do you believe in? I know, I know clearly, without a doubt, Jesus rose again from the dead. And because Jesus rose again from the dead, I know there's a resurrection. And if I put my faith and trust in Him according to His promise, who obviously has the power of death and life, 
I can have eternal life and to be with Him one day forever because He promised that, because He is the resurrection and the life. So Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And God bless you. If you're here today or viewing this online and you've not received Jesus as Savior and Lord, then dear folks, today, today, embrace Christ because He is alive and promises you eternal life if you put your faith and trust in Him. So God bless you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.